Jack Kerouac's writing advice is eccentric and a tad esoteric. And today I'm going to be breaking it down for you guys, but I don't want to over-intellectualize any of this because that's what the beat writers and poets stood up against. And the idea of spontaneous writing or stream of consciousness writing, integrating Zen or Eastern elements and looking and find yourself, finding yourself within nature are the big contributions that the beats made to writing. Looking back, a lot of their writing, minus a few authors and a few books, aren't that good and don't really hold up past, present, or future in terms of objective quality. But a lot of writers who are caught up in trying to make money or trying to be too serious and get an MFA or do these things actually need some beats in their life. They need that beat rebellion and mentality and non-caring, and that will help them get to the next level of their poetry because caring too much and being too invested in all of this as like a writer is a really good way to put too much pressure on yourself and start and produce works that aren't good enough. So Jack Kerouac's advice that we're going to be looking at today to writers is a list of 30 things. And I'm also going to be in, um, bringing some ideas in from some of his interviews and other stuff where he talks about writing. And the ideas at some level are also a spoof on giving advice to, to writers as you're going to see. So just keep that all in mind. And we also need to refrain from over romanticizing the beats. I remember when I read Dharma Bums when I was 18, I literally dropped everything. I was in college and I said, I'm taking a week off of school and I hitchhiked from Utah to Montana. And I know a lot of other people who you know did similar things when they, they've encountered beat, you know, the beats. And the beats, even though they were spontaneous and fun and have, have a lot of cool stories, a lot of them, most of them like Kierbach were alcoholics, they were jerks. They were, some were domestic abusers. I've met a, I've met a couple of beat poets, yes, in their old age, but they were, were very, not not very personable compared to the other, uh, to other, other hundreds of authors I've met. You know, um, Michael McClure, Jack Snyder, or Gary Snyder, and Joanne Kiger were very, I would say, cold. Um, and Michael McClure was maybe one of the coldest people and meanest writers I've ever met and just treating me like fodder and pushing me through the line, you know, I'll, and I'll tell that story another time. So let's hop into it though. Uh, I'll maybe, you know, I'll get into some anecdotes along the way. So a uh, piece of advice, number one, scribble secret notebooks and wild typewritten pages for your own joy. And you have to write for our own joy, you know, secret notebooks, wild pages, like the spontaneous writing. Uh, Michael McClure said in his presentation at the event where he was mean to me and many others that, you know, Jack Kerouac didn't write, didn't revise at all, especially at the start. Jack Kerouac wrote On the Road in a couple weeks. He wrote another book that's slipping my mind right now in three days. So uh, these novels. So, you know, there was a very spontaneous, hardworking lifestyle. And if you look at like a Jack Kerouac, for instance, he was a athlete. He was a nose to the grindstone kind of guy who kind of met this beat lifestyle. And they, he could view, he didn't, he says he hates writing, that he hated writing the whole time. It was really just a way to make money or to put himself out there. And it's kind of a very weird mentality, a very weird era in the sense that a lot of these writers really, other than maybe Ginsburg and Snyder and maybe Kiger, really were just writing for fun because they didn't really have that much output. They didn't really spend that much time writing um, and like really practicing their craft compared to other areas. If we go back 20, 30 years and we're looking and we look at Denise Levertov, for instance, she was writing for hours and hours every single day. But one thing that I think made them so good and helped them make progress was the secret writing, the secret notebooks, wild typewritten pages, joyful writing. And when you do that enough, and that adds that adds up eventually, you know, if you're just writing random poems throughout the day or when you can, eventually after a couple of years, you might have a couple hundred poems and that's some good experience. And then suddenly you're a beginner intermediate poet and you have the ability to even write great poems. So, you know, I think that's really good advice that you should always be writing, that you should be writing whenever, you know, I just talked about that in my, um, a video yesterday on John Berryman's writing advice. And John Berryman would only write one stanza a day and, you know, spend the rest of the day analyzing it and revising it. Very slow, very, you know, very interesting. So next is you need to be submissive to everything, open, listening. And this is obvious, man, that a lot of people aren't like uh, bringing back Berryman yesterday. I didn't mention this. He says he has no, he had no connection to nature and he ended up killing himself. And you wonder why the beat poets you know, in San Francisco would, would sit under, you know, it's sitting under trees in parks in San Fran and drink wine and smoke weed and hang out all day, you know, and that creates a certain connection, you know, being outside, laughing, being, you know, having fun, observing things, writing haikus, studying the Zen, 
you know, the, the Zen haiku poets, you know, Basho, Sifis, like some of the other ones. And, you know, you have to be open. You have to listen. And this is a big thing. If you're going to do stream of consciousness writing or intuitive writing, you have to really that your ability to do that, unless you're like the one, unless you're just the intuitive talent, you have to learn to listen and open up. And for a lot of people, that doesn't come easy because we've been trained not to do that. Our schooling system and a lot of our parents and a lot of jobs teach you not to feel, not to be intuitive. Our whole life is regimented and scheduled. We can't really be intuitive because guess what? It's Friday night, but on Monday morning, you're back on the grindstone or like whatever your schedule is. So yeah, you have to learn to be more open and intuitive. Next is try never to get drunk outside your own house. And I don't know what that means, but you know, that could be taken a lot of different ways, but you know, Jack Kerouac liked to drink in general and drink and write. And I don't know if that's, if, you know, I'm not going to look too deep into that, but you know, you could look at, you could take, we could, I could reach here and be like, you know, your house, you know, um, your own house is your own creative mind and don't get drunk outside of that. You know, who, who knows though? Um, these are, these are old, these are, I'm not, a, are you an alcoholic? I'm not. So I don't know what that means. Next is be in love with your life. And this is so important. This is Rilke. You must change your life. Rilke's advice. You must change your life if you want to be a great poet, if you want to be a great writer. How much more, if you experience life a hundred times more, how many stories, how many ideas would you have? I know so many writers who are writing nothing. Like, look at your writing. Are you even writing anything? Like, is there substance in there? Or is it just another retold story that's maybe just a little bit different? But if you took some time off from writing and lived life or you know, experimented with drugs or sex or any of these things, maybe you could come up with some new revelations. Something you five, something that you feel will find its own form. And once again, yes, that um, Berryman talked about this yesterday. Berryman, one of the best American poets and confessional poets. I think he was way better than a lot of these beat poets, but that you, other than Snyder, that, and maybe Ginsburg, that you have to, and I think he knew Ginsburg, that you have to, if you have a passion, if you create an experiment something, with something enough, it will find its own form that outside of natural form. And like, if you have to feel it first, it has to come. And once again, where does that come from? It comes from experience or being really good. So if you're not going to go out in life and experiencing, experiencing things, right? Then you need to learn to meditate. You need to learn to observe and really understand your own emotions. You can't be a reclusive sitting on your phone. I know so many writers who like are choosing this more introverted, reclusive lifestyle. Great, cool. But you can't be on your phone all day, man. You have to be being a sad girl or sad boy and examining yourself, actually, not numbing yourself, not getting on antidepressants. Like if you're gonna be, do be reclusive, then you're going to have to really try to love solitude and quietness. And it's really easy now. All I have to do is look at a computer and I cannot, you know, I can not feel as alone anymore. Be crazy, dumb saint of the mind. You know, who knows what that means? Blow as deep as you want to blow and <laughs> You know, I guess that you could take that as just go as deep as you want to go, man. Don't be scared. I know so many writers and people who are ashamed of so many aspects of their life. Their whole life is, you know, not very deep. And they, you know, when you can go as deep as you want to go, you can really do anything you want to do as long as it's not really harming any other humans and hopefully not the earth or animals either. You know, you can do whatever, think whatever, be whoever, just don't be violent. Like so simple, right? Like, but we haven't, you know, got that down yet as human beings. Write what you want bottomless from bottom of the mind, the unspeakable visions of the individual. And so this is really get, getting into the unconscious, right? That the unconscious, right? We've talked about the spontaneous poetry, intuitive poetry. A lot of these are gonna be the same, but you know, you have to bring it out from the unconscious, the bottomless bottom of the mind, the visions of the individual, like what is happening for you? You've had a unique programming in your life and you have to share that with the world. And if you know, if you learn how to write with craft and style and practice, you know, practice craft and you will have something very unique to share and can help and change the world even. So no time for poetry, but exactly what is. Does anyone have any idea? No time for poetry, but exactly what is. Oh, I didn't know what this, this is observation, right? You have to, there is no time for poetry, but just what is in reality. A lot of the, look at Gary Snyder's poetry, the haiku poets. You have to just know what's happening in reality. You don't have to go off into these crazy places. Just be what, do what is observe what is and start from there. A lot of people can't even write about their house or like objects beautifully. So why are you giving us a novel? So many people literally can't write a nice three line poem. That's how I, with my writing students, that's why I start off with, I'm like, okay, let's make three lines beautiful because if you can't make three lines beautiful, then why would you ever waste anyone's time with 30 lines? So much easier to keep things confined. And if you can master that, then all you have to do is just do that over and over again. And then suddenly you have a 30 line poem that's beautiful. It's like trying to master 
like think of a skill, right? Think of like, you know, um, like chess, right? Imagine like chess players say, hey, just focus on puzzles in the middle of the game. Don't focus on the end game or the, or the openings. Just focus on what happens in the middle. But imagine being a new chess player and trying to learn the most advanced tactics of Magnus Carlsen or somebody. You'd, you'd be, everyone would be like, you're so silly. But with writing, people try to do that all the time. They try to write these complex narratives or these things. And it's like, no, can you even make something small beautiful? Visionary ticks shivering in the, in, in the chest. In transfixation, dreaming upon an object before you. So these visionary ticks, these things, it's intuitive. It comes. It, it's a wave. It is art. It is the connection to the ether. And you can manifest this. You can sit. If you, the more you sit in the chair and work, the closer you will be to making this happen. Dreaming upon the object before you. If you can get in that trance, that's going to work out better for you. Next, we have remove literary, literary grammatical, and syntactical inhibition. So many writers I know, they get caught up in literary inhibition, man. They use grammar and syntax and all these things. No, just write. Please just write. We can fix all that later. Just write. Don't get boggled down in semicolon land or all these different things. Don't worry about that. Look at Cormac McCarthy, our greatest living author in the world right now. The dude doesn't use quotation marks. He doesn't use a lot of punctuation marks. You don't have to get bogged down in that. Once again, you can fix all that in revision. If it's good enough, an editor will know and publish you. Like Proust, be an old tea head of time. And I don't know what that means necessarily because, you know, in search of lost times and remembrance of lost time, um, Bruce's great series. Um, I would recommend everyone go and read that. Um, mind blowing, very weird. Um, in search of lost time by Proust or Swan's way, blah, blah, blah. But Proust, you know, was very interested in memory and the moment and capturing time. And I think that's what he's, I think that really inspired a lot of beat poets and a lot of our generation now of understanding and the recollection, recollection of memory and emotions. So 15, telling the true story of the world in interior monologue. The jewel center of interest is the eye within the eye. So now we're getting into more Zen. Uh, the jewel of center of interest is the eye within the eye that could be referred to the inner eye, the inner mind, the interior monologue, the inner world. You have to bring the inner world to life. This is very psychoanalytic. I mean, we all know this as writers, but once again, a lot of people don't because see a lot of people's writing. I'm like, man, you must be really boring inside, man. You have no kinks, you have no fetishes and not saying you have to bring those out. But if you are weird at any level, then that can flourish in a million different directions and to a million different stories. And why not give that to the public? Write in recollection and in amazement for yourself. And yes, you need to write something that will blow your own mind, that makes you happy, that makes, that makes you like, oh my God, what am I even doing? That's how you write well. Next, 18, worked from pithy, middle eye out, swimming in language C. We'll just, I don't know about this one, swimming in the language C, maybe with the third eye out. You just have to be swimming in the ocean of language and see what happens. Accept loss forever. And this is very Buddhist, right? Um, you have to accept loss or, you know, you're going to be bogged down, man. If you have, if you're worried about death, if you're still denying death and like not, you know, if you deny death too much, you'll never experience life. And that's kind of the paradox from Ernest Becker that the more we live life, the more we want to deny death because the more you experience life and understand it, the more attached you become to it. So at some level, you can prevent a lot of that by just accepting loss, man. Like everyone's going to die. All these things around you, they're not going to be around. All your prized possessions are going to end up in a dumpster one day. Sad, but your contributions to the energetic sphere of the world and maybe through art and with your family and those things, those live on forever. So why not, you know, we can become immortal. It's just different. And, you know, I'm not going, okay, I have, I have a rant ready that has nothing to do with this that I just love to give all the time, but we're going to move on. Believe in the holy contour of life. And yes, you have to have a degree of holiness. We live in this society of digital technology is ruining our ability along with atheism and agnosticism to actually connect and with the divine. Yes, I'm saying the divine. I don't, the non-hierarchical divine has no connection to any former religion and being able to tap into that and into something outside of yourself is step number one if you, <laughs> toward um, individuation and higher con and achieving mystical states. And if you don't do that, you are just going to be needing to rely on drugs and sex and other things to be able to achieve that. And, you know, that's why I'm, you know, all my atheists out there, ha ha ha, man, you're still, you know, you, you can play logical games all day, but your life will not be what it can be. Struggle to sketch the flow that already exists intact in the mind. So there's a flow in our mind. There is this idea. And a lot of poets back in the day, if we look at Beowulf and our, the Arthurian legends, the Green Knight, even Chaucer, a lot of poets in different languages that I don't, I can't they, um, tell, um, they would write 
the works mimicking nature they would look at a form like i have this plant over here that you guys can't see and they would literally try to mimic the form of the plant in their poem and not with, with the form not with like making it a picture but they would really weirdly because like think about it think if you sat and meditated on this plant over here or on something for hundreds of hours over the course of a couple of years and it was part of rituals and stuff you start to understand maybe a deeper elements of it maybe it's all made up in your head but you start understanding things and the plant is your axiomatic base instead of so a lot of people, once again, they write, they start writing because they are writing from a traumatized place. They are writing because they were never taken seriously or they want to make money. They don't like their day job. They think they're, they are writers. They've repeated that they are writers in their head. But instead, what if you wrote for something that's more powerful than that, which is something that exists in objective reality, especially from the natural world that creates good writing. You know, most of the time that helps you a lot more than like, it's again, writing from ego land. 22, don't think of words when you stop, but to see picture better. Keep track of every day, the date emblazoned in your morning. Okay, who knows about that one? But don't think of, of words when you stop, but to see the picture better. You know, we have to see the picture better. The beats and people were trying to transcribe reality and images to the reader and, you know, try to see that better. And don't think of words, try to get the picture better. See the picture better and the words will come. Once again, I might be reaching here, who knows? This might be totally wrong, but this is, I'm, I'm trying to stay within the tradition of the beat poets. I'm trying to frame this from that reality, not some, you know, even my opinion. No fear or shame in the dignity of your experience, language, and knowledge. Yep, exactly. No fear. Fear is the mind killer. Please don't be afraid. Don't be shameful. And if you are, spend a year or two working on that before you become a writer because we don't need any more muddled, fearful, repressed writing. Write for the word to write for the world to read and see your exact pictures of it. Exactly. This is Haiku 101. This is the East. This is please give us some nature. Give us some semblance of reality. Don't become another poet writing romantic or a writer writing just dumb romance stories. You know, we're we're past that MFA BS now. We can write better than that. We can write the world and write of the world and connect with nature and then bring that experience to the readers because that is the real experience of life. It's this reality, all this, all this around me, this house is made of wood from a forest and everything around me came from nature. I came from the ground. I'm going back into the ground. Like that is the base of our, even our unconscious. And it's a great tactic, especially if you want the money, if you want the fame to write from that point of view. But it's also the most effective thing you can do to help readers. Book movie is the movie in words, the visual American form. Okay, I'm not even gonna try that one. In praise of character, and the bleak and human loneliness. 27. 28. Composing wild, undisciplined, pure, coming in from under, crazier the better. Yes, wild, undisciplined, pure. Do it, man. Like, please try it. This helped me, like, dude, I was not a good poet. I'm not great now either. I'm not, maybe I'm not even good, but I am way better, like, hundreds of times better than I was before. Like, I started writing, like, spontaneous and beat in a beat type way. And I don't necessarily do that as much anymore. But if I need to, I will like, if I'm like having some writer's block or trying to struggle, I'll just write, just start writing three liners, a couple liners, just start writing just quick standards and not even just throw them away. I just literally throwing them on the ground. I have pieces of paper and just throwing them away. Just spontaneous, just to get things going, just to get pictures down from reality, just moving images around. And that's what you need to do. And once you become comfortable with that, then you can, you know, revise and cater and create masterpieces. You were a genius all the time. Exactly. You are a creative genius. I say that all the time on this channel, man. You are a creative genius who can change the world with your writing. Number 30, and to conclude, writer, director of earthly movie sponsored and angeled in heaven. I'm going to reach on this one. You know, writer, director of earthly movies, bringing the earth to humans sponsored and angeled in heaven. Maybe you'll become angeled in heaven. Who knows, everybody? Let me know what I've gotten wrong here. This is Jack Kerouac's writing advice. This is just about, I've, really much covered everything else that I read in this presentation. If you guys like this video, leave a comment, subscribe, and go check out uh, my video on John Berryman's writing advice because I mentioned him in this. Peace.